Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's good to be with you all here tonight. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to to jump into this very big to topic of uh, bishop uh, and pawn endings. It's a very big topic, and certainly we cannot learn everything about it in, in one night, but we'll try to get through the most important uh, positions and important ideas that uh, will help supercharge your understanding uh, of this part of the game. It presents a lot of interesting positions, uh, especially at the highest level. These are the kind of endings that someone can sit and suffer for, for many, many hours in, in a game. So, yeah, I just want to quickly grab a few exercise positions that will work with the first introduction that I want to make. Uh, but whilst I'm doing that, and as I start to share my screen, maybe, okay. The zoom. Okay, good. There we go. So let's share the screen. Right. So we want to use this for now. We are going to quickly be using chess base for the introduction. Um, first of all, I must start by saying, and I'm sure all of us know this, that you are not able to win with a bishop, a bishop and king versus king. This position you cannot win. Right? You cannot win because there is insufficient checkmating material. Now, this is a very important detail for us to know because a lot. This is one. Uh, this is one idea that the opponent can always try to do. If we are up with a pawn in a bishop ending, the opponent is always willing to sacrifice their bishop for a pawn because they understand this basic position that we are not able to win if we only have a bishop, uh, if we only have a bishop versus a king. So this is something to keep in mind so that when you try to win these positions, you don't, uh, you don't get careless. Uh, but before I talk too much, I try to also make sure that these lessons are very interactive, that everyone is speaking. Um, so before I go any further, I would just like to ask a few of you uh, who are willing to just uh, tell us what you understand about uh, bishop, uh, bishop endings. So the bishop and... The two bishop, the bishop and pawn endings. What do you understand uh, about them? Um, what I know is you get a, a a good bishop and a bad bishop. So, like, if you guys both have pawns that are locked in the center, if your bishop is on the same color as the enemy pawns, you have a strong bishop. Okay. Thank you, Rowan. Anyone else would like to contribute what they know about these positions? The bishop and pawn endings. Uh, hi everyone. Hello. Um. Okay, there's also the idea of the wrong color, the wrong color rook pawn um, that can be used in drawing in these um, bishop endings. Thank you. And who is speaking? If I might just get the name. Uh, it's Tapio Gwarazim. All right, Tapio. Thank you. Yes, that is very true. Well done. And for those that are not aware, we can just quickly see, because that also is another important position to remember, is that if we just uh, push this bishop, I don't know, it's actually the right bishop. So oh, in, in this sense, it's the wrong bishop. Uh, now, if you have not seen this position before, this will probably be shocking to you that the opponent has four points advantage, but this position is going to end up as a draw. 
Now you might be thinking, uh, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. I have a pawn and a bishop. Surely I must be winning. But uh, for I'm sure many of you know already, this position is not uh, winning because white, which is what Tapio was telling us, white has the bishop, which doesn't match the right color square. So this is called the wrong color bishop. If you have a white squares bishop and the pawn is queening, particularly only the rook pawn, really. So it's important to know the pawn on the rook file or the rook pawn demands that if you want to queen it, you must have the bishop that controls that color square. Because the way to draw this position is very simple. Black after white makes a move, let's just say uh, white plays h3. Bus pawns must be pushed, but then black just goes and parks the bus in the corner. Uh, we can give white the best possible position, and white will not be able to do anything because there is no way for this bishop. This bishop is almost a piece that is useless. It cannot force the opponent's king out of this uh, wrong color square. So these are some things that are important to know before we we take a deep dive, or not a deep dive, but just at least enough knowledge that you are going to definitely have confidence when you play uh, bishop endings with pawns, that you have important knowledge uh, about what you need to do. Uh, so, all right, let's go to, so what you should already know before this lesson. Now, so this is information that if you know this already, this means anything that you're going to learn today is only going to uh, help you even more. Now, if you don't know this information, don't feel intimidated. All of us have to learn. Chess is a process, it takes time. Uh, but these, uh, these are just a few things that are important to know. These fall more on end game strategy. So there are two types of endings mainly. The end games that are theoretical, meaning you need to know important positions. You need to know the plan and you need to know who is winning, who is drawing and who is losing. These end games can be studied. You can memorize them by heart. Uh, and I'm sure as many of us know, this is one such example where you must memorize by heart. You must know this, that this position is always going to end up as a draw. And uh, even for the skeptic, I will show us a picture uh, that is very alarming. Right, we can give our opponent, uh, uh, of course, it probably is a bit extreme. I think more the pawns if they increase than the bishop increase. But even with the bishops, it still cannot uh, uh, be winning. Uh, because this position, no matter how much material the opponent might have, is still going to end up as a draw. Because there is no way to force... Uh, this king out of the square. Now, I know for sure someone is saying this guy is definitely now teaching us uh, things that are not true. So maybe let me just start by showing an example of this so that we can start on the right foot. So an example. Let's uh, do board edit and set up that same position we saw now. So let's just put these pawns uh, on the board. And put the white bishop here, put the white king here, the black king in the corner. It's white to play, and all of that. So let's see quickly. Now, let me ask a question. Do you believe that this position is a draw? If you don't believe that it's a draw, please unmute and say why you think it is not a draw. So I'm taking it everyone believes that this position is a draw. Okay, so I like to always ask a lot of questions. You notice I'm asking you a lot of questions tonight. So it is not enough to have the right answer. So I'm going to pick someone at random since all of you agree that it is a draw, so be prepared. I, I must tell you right away, everyone is going to speak tonight. 
right? So you must be prepared to speak uh, in this lesson. So you won't be surprised if I call out your name. So since everyone believes that this is a draw, I'm going to pick one person and they must explain why they say this position is a draw. It's not enough to give a good answer. I need to know why you say that. Okay, so I hope that one person is ready. Annabelle, tell us why you think this position is a draw. Yes, Annabelle, I can't hear. What did you say? Maybe the network is not good. Okay, let's pick someone else. Uh, Chakudzwa, why do you say this position is a draw? Chakudzwa, KFNA team. Why do you say this position is a draw? I hope all of you can hear me. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. yes can hear um, all right. So if, if the only way that this is not a draw is Black somehow decides to to take his king and run to a eight. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Thank you. So the position is a draw, and we'll prove it to some some who are skeptics uh, that might not have dared to say why. So as you can see here, this is called an end game. Um, what do they call it? Table base. It tells you the final result of some end game positions. I think they have up until eight or nine pieces. So here we can already have a, if you will, a cheat sheet. It tells us everything that can be played in this position. The game can either end as a stalemate right away. This is immediately agreeing to a draw, stalemating black. Any move that white plays, the game will be a draw. So long as black uh, doesn't lose their head and goes and starts making a tour, right? So with so much material, it is amazing that the position is still a draw. So these are the, these are the theoretical endings that uh, we must know by heart. And we'll see a lot of positions tonight about that but i want us to know a little bit on the end game strategy side what is the number one plan in every chess end game so if you think you have the answer please unmute and tell us what is the number one plan in every chess end game doesn't matter it's a king and pawn ending it doesn't matter it's a oh, pass ending. Pawn. Pass pawn. someone Claim pass one. Uh, yes. Yeah, pass pawn is a pawn that cannot be stopped because there is no pawn in front of it. Yes. And that then it ties the king down to defending it throughout the whole way while your own king makes way and does something else. Yes. No, thanks, uh, D David. That's true. Right. A pass pawn. Number one plan in every chess ending is create a pass pawn. Doesn't matter what end game it is. The most important plan in chess endings, because I know some of you think that in the end game you should play to checkmate, throw away that plan. It's not right. The reason why we normally say the game is in the end game is because a direct attack against a king normally doesn't work right away because there's not enough pieces to force checkmate right away because normally if you want to checkmate a king you need at least three or more pieces and usually in the end game you don't have that many pieces to force checkmate right away so the end game unlike the opening and the middle game the plan is very different the plan in the end game number one is create a passed pawn and if you have it you need to push it Fast pawns must be pushed. Right. Okay. What is the second most important plan in every chess ending? Well, yeah, I really still. Okay, there is one exception, but in many chess endings, what is the most important plan? 
the second most important plan. Uh, to activate your king. Correct. Bring your king to the center. Right. The king comes to the center for two reasons. Number one, to attack the weak pawns of the opponent. Of the opponent, that's number one. And number two, to protect or support. To support its past pawn. Right. It supports the past pawn to the promotion square. But the main reason the king we bring the king to the center or to activate our king is to attack the weak pawns of the opponent. Quickly, what is a weak pawn? Yes, thank you, Reynard Prinslow. Activate the king. Um, what is a weak pawn? What does it mean to have a weak pawn in chess? Matthew? What is a weak pawn in chess? Uh, I think it's an isolated pawn. That is an example of a weak pawn. Thank you, Matthew. Okay. If it's isolated by a peanut, yeah. But okay, so the gen what that those are examples of weak pawns. But what is the real meaning of a weak pawn? Why do we call a, an isolated pawn a weak pawn? Because it's undefended it's a, from another yeah. pawn. <laughs> Correct. Thank you, David and Rowan. Right. A weak pawn is a pawn that cannot be defended by another pawn. Uh, we can have an example. Like, for instance, all these four pawns are isolated because there are no pawns of the same color next to them. They can never be defended by another pawn. So all these are actually weak pawns because no pawn can defend it. So it's a weak pawn. So that is what a weak pawn is. They can be isolated, they can be doubled, they can be backwards pawn, and all the other types of weak pawns, but mainly because no other pawn of the same color can defend them. All right, number three. What is the third most important plan in every chess ending? Thank you. Okay, number three. What is the third most important plan in every chess ending? Anything, uh, Hannah? What is the third most important plan in every chess end? Hannah, you can hear me. Okay. Oh, by the way, don't be surprised if your name has been called out. I've already said what, I, what you should expect. All of you are going to say something tonight. So don't be surprised if I call your name. If you can't speak, type in chat, but everyone will say something. Uh, we are all going to participate. Okay, so let's see, if, uh, Peter, what is the third most important plan in every chess ending? Okay. T. Matsi Matsisilo. What is the third most important plan in every chess endgame? Okay, well, if no one is going to answer, Michael is waiting to give us the right answers. Michael has all the right answers. Michael, what is the third most important plan in every chess ending? So we've already had promoting pawns and activating the king. So I'd say yeah. targeting weaknesses would be my guess. Yeah, uh, weaknesses, but okay. Activate your pieces. Okay. All your pieces, all your pieces must be active. This is extremely important in all end games. All your pieces must be active. Must be active. 
it's not an option. If you want to play end games very well, just start doing this simple thing and you see your chess endings change completely. All your pieces must be active. This means the pieces must be on open lines if they are rooks, open diagonals, bishops, knights in the outpost, the king bring, brought to the center, the queen is in the center of the board. Your pieces must be active. And then the last one, I'll write it because of time, and then we'll quick. So, so Dion, I'm just confused. Uh, you said in game, but you said queen. So, uh, at which point do you decide it's in game? I, I always thought if, you, if your count is around about nine your points, then you mm. enter the, uh, the in game. But uh, how do you then identify the in game position? That is a very good question, and I'll try to answer it as best as possible. They are. Uh, the basic one that is given, it must be less than nine points or that there are few pieces left on the board. But generally, an end game is shown that the king is safe enough to come out and play. But when you have queen endings, they are pure queen endings. These are end games where you only have queens for both sides. So those end games are special. Because the end games with two rooks and a queen, those are not really end games. They are playing both with end game ideas and mid to game ideas because with two rooks and a queen you can be checkmated so that really falls in between but most of the endings are a little bit more clear but queen endings only without other pieces they are those are count as end games i hope i answered the question yeah thank you okay wonderful okay number four do not rush so this one is the one that is written in all caps the reason why many, many chess players, we always go home without that half a point or we lose end games is we rush when we play the end game. Now, of course, some of us take too much time in the opening and the middle game. We have no choice but to panic. But even when some of us have a lot of time, we still want to rush. Who would like to explain to me what this do not rush principle means? Uh, according to your own understanding, what do you think this do not rush means? I beg your pardon. What do you think this uh, principle number four, do not rush in the end game? What do you think that means? Um, it, it probably means not to like play so fast because yes. in the end game, there are fewer pieces. Mm -hmm. And if you make a mistake, it can cost you the whole game. So you have to think more in the end game. That is very true. Thank you. Uh, and also, uh, Reynard Prinslow, in the chat, do not, do not play too fast. In the end game, you must not play too quickly because you are going to lose many, many games or uh, lose po uh, half points that you could have saved. Now we have talked, we have written a lot of things. Let's start by some uh, introduction based on that earlier idea that the one thing you need to watch out for is take your time to evaluate the position correct the most important thing you need to do in the end game is come up with the right judgment which is evaluation am i winning am i losing am i drawing uh, and what is my plan that's why you hear a lot of grandmasters advise anyone who really wants to take chess seriously to start by studying the end game because the end game will teach you to become very good at planning. Because in end games, if you don't know the plan, you are never going to play well. Uh, in the opening, anyone can fake it. You know, you just throw pieces somewhere. In the middle game, the same. You can just find a cheap trick and win against your opponent. But in the end game, there are important end game positions that if you don't know what is the right judgment, is this a winning position? Is it a draw? Is it losing? You won't come up with the right plan and you end up either losing the games you should not lose or drawing the positions that you should win. The end game, you can study it and master it because the end game doesn't change too much. The ideas and the plans in the end game don't change too much. They take very, very long to change. Unlike the opening, the openings that were accepted at the highest level 20 years ago, most of them are rubbish today because the computer showed that those moves were not very good. 
the mid game is very complicated. It involves many things, tactics, combinations, sacrifices, weak pawns, all of those things. So there's many things to learn and you can never really fully master it all at once. But the end game, if you really invest time, you can master the end game. Uh, the former world champion, Jose Raul Capablanca said, uh, before you do anything else in chess, you must master the end game. And no wonder he was one of the greatest end game players to ever play the game. Okay, enough talking. Let's now do some positions. So these two examples are going to support the earlier idea that when you play the bishop endings, you need to watch out for drawing ideas. Now, of course, this is not a bishop ending, but it will soon turn out to be this way. Firstly, what do you think is going to be the final result in this position? Is it going to be winning? Is it going to be losing? Is it going to be drawing? So I'll give you one or two minutes. Just need to grab a charger quickly. Whose move is it? Yeah, I want to know whose move it is as well. I'm assuming it's White's move. <clears throat> yes, yeah, sorry, it is White's move. I didn't say it is White's move. So, what do you think would be the final result? Is it winning? Is it drawing? Uh, or is it losing for white losing. So I think someone said it's losing David said it's losing okay there is a draw so Darren and Burton is a draw okay Tapiwa Gora says it's a draw all right so as I have already given the warning at the beginning it's not enough to give the right answer so uh, Tapiwa why do you say it's a draw Um, because white can draw by force. Um, okay. one black. Okay. Um, there's an idea of creating the wrong color rook pawn. Mm. Um, and white can do this by force by playing rook e8 check, rook f8, uh, rook takes f8, king takes f8, then followed by bishop h6. Um, whatever black does. Um. The position will end up in a draw. Wonderful, amazing stuff, uh, Tapiwa. So your your right evaluation or judgment has given you the right plan and the right calculation, and that's why it is important to always judge the position in the end game. No, from the beginning, is it winning, losing, or drawing, and make the right plan. And the right plan is what we saw earlier on. The idea of the wrong bishop, the wrong color bishop. So white had to see this quite uh, far ahead and now white simply makes a draw and black is shocked because earlier on you see we learned that the number one plan in the end game in every end game is to create a pass pawn and if you have it push it black should have been would have been celebrating you know they're in dreamland not only do they have a pass pawn they have two of them the position surely must be winning but from out of nowhere uh, black is suddenly ashamed because they are not able to go and convert this position. Even if the king doesn't move anywhere, we are still going to sacrifice this bishop. Now you see what I was saying earlier on. This is a very important idea to keep in mind. When you have the bishop uh, and pawn endings, always watch out for your opponent sacrificing their bishop for a pawn or even uh, to leave you with a bishop when you can't checkmate, or they can sacrifice it for a pawn and leave you with the wrong pawn and you are not able to, to win. We'll look at one more and then we'll start to study step by step some of this so that we can have enough time to look at some of the games that grandmasters have played to sh uh, show us some of these things. Okay, so let's look at one more example. Uh, Okay, it is, it is the white stand. If you think you have the answer, you can go ahead and unmute and tell us. Uh, 
Wait. Yeah. Someone yeah, wants bishop yeah. takes h six. Bishop takes h six. Correct. It's the same idea again. This time we have now seen it a few times, and the king still is enough in enough time to rush to the corner. And again, it is a very sad thing for black. With four points ahead, the win is not in sight. Okay, let us now look at some uh, examples. So we are going to start by looking at the opposite color uh, bishop endgames. We'll look at some key uh, positions for us to know. And then we'll also look at the bishop of the same color some key positions and as well as uh, yeah the exercises i'll share with michael then or as well as with all the course material you can practice uh, from what you are learning tonight you can practice with the examples to see if you uh, understand the work that we are covering tonight so okay page 67 all right, so we are going to first look at this key position. Are there any questions so far? If you have any questions, please don't let me continue talking. Ask me questions right away so that uh, yeah, you leave understanding some of these things. So this is the first diagram we are going to, to look at. Okay, so this is the position. And decide uh, to move. Right, of course, it is important to know in order to, uh, to play these end games, there are some specific positions. In other words, very important positions that you need to know by heart to be able to play some of these end games. Uh, like for instance this is one such example where we can start by looking at the way here despite the king being active we say that in the end game the king must be active to attack the weak pawns what is the name of this weak pawn uh, matthew what do we call what is the name of this weak pawn on e3 Um, an, an isolated pawn? Or it could almost become an isolated pawn, but this is called the backwards pawn. Uh, I think someone typed it in chat. Mm. Yes, backwards pawn. Yeah, from Reynard. It's a backwards pawn, yes. So a backwards pawn, why do we call it a backwards pawn? It's behind the pawns next to it. If there was another pawn here, this would still be a backwards pawn. So the king is there, but it's not really able to take it because of the bishop. So why uh, this king is much more active than this king, but black is not able to make any progress because any time this king attacks, even if it's black's turn to play, any time you attack, I'll just go here. And now it will look a little bit silly. Where is your improvement plan? How can you improve this position if you are playing with black and try to win this game? Or do you, if anyone thinks that black can win here, what would black's improvement plan be? Uh, would a d5 be uh, an idea? Okay, so I want to give up the pawn. Because if, if king takes, you push the b pawn. But if the other pawn, if the e pawn takes, you can take it the f pawn. And then there's two isolated pawns on d and h squares. Yeah, okay. So let's try it. So d4 check now, of course, the dream is when the opponent 
forgets that the king is out of the square, right? The rule of the square, you must always make sure if the opponent has a fast pawn, your king must stay in the square of the pawn. So, of course, the opponent won't play bad moves. So this is forced. But, of course, we have improved black's position. But do we still, are we able to improve it any further than this? Can you win from this position with black? It's not very clear how else to improve the position because the problem is uh, this king is sitting on the... And this is usually the problem with opposite colored bishop endings. If your king stands or your pawns stand on the wrong color squares, they are almost invincible. In fact, not almost. They are invincible to the opponent's bishop. So this bishop is basically useless. It can't attack the weak pawns. It can't move this king for anywhere. And this king can't get too close, right? Our bishop is defending the pawns. If the king attacks, uh, it's even white's turn to play. White can just play some move like this. This g5 push can never work. And the position is just going to be, uh, to be a draw because of the... Uh, although black species, as we have learned, the third most important plan is have active pieces. Black species are much more active than, than white species. But here, even with the activity, black is not able to force a win. White can just keep this king sitting here, defending the pawn. The bishop can start moving back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. As soon as you push the pawn, I can take it, and we can agree to a draw. So let us see. Uh, someone wants to say something. I thought there was a possibility of eventually pushing g5 and then pushing the h pawn. And while the bishop on e6 controls the queening square of the other pawn when it gets to g5, but you just take back with the bishop. Yes. So yeah, it's a dead draw. Yeah, definitely. No, yeah. If there was no way for the bishop, this, okay, it must be said, even though you have a very clear draw, you can't play carelessly. If you move this bishop randomly, you can end up losing the game, right? So it must be said, of course, now, uh, who has heard this before? That all opposite color bishop endings are draw. If you have heard this before, please uh, make it known. <laughs> I'm sure all of us have heard this before. That all times. Yeah, right. That all bishop opposite color bishop endings are draw. That's not true. That's so uh, that is an untrue statement. So don't take that by heart. You can lose many of them if you believe that. It's not true. They can, they have a very high chances to draw, but not all of them are draw. So that's what we must always be careful when you learn, especially about principles. The same thing with these four steps that I've given you. If you go and you lose a game and you say, Well, that man taught us nonsense, the stuff that he said I tried it, it didn't work. Now, nine out of 10 times, these things always work, but there's always that one chance that you might follow that plan. It wasn't the right plan. Chess is very concrete. You must worry about the position in front of you and try to figure out the best plan in that position. I can't just give you one answer for everything. The same thing with this rule that, or this principle that all bishop opposite color endings are drawn. That's not a true statement. It's true in many cases, but it's not true. It's a very high chance to draw. So let's look at a few of these draws that one should know by heart. So some minimum positions that one should know. Uh, this is one such example. Right. So this position was uh, set up in 1899. Uh, by beggar, it is a study. So this is again what I was saying earlier on. The theory or the ideas and the plans of the endgame don't change too much. If this position was uh, released in 1899, which is about 122 years ago, and it's still today, you can play it and still make a draw. It shows why it pays off to study the endgame. 
the work doesn't change overnight. We can't have new end game rules the next day. You can, uh, you can really master this part of the game. So in this position, it is wise to play. What do you think is the right judgment of this position? Is it winning? Is it a draw? Is it a loss? What do you think is the right judgment? Um, white would probably want a win. Probably. Well, black would want to do. Okay. So let us, yeah. Well, probably white wants to win. That's true. But if you want to, to really become good at endings, become very clear. Is it winning? Is it a draw? Is it a loss? So that's what I want to, uh, to hear so that you can come up with the right plan. Without the right judgment, you can't find the right plan. You're always going to plan the wrong thing. So you need to know for sure, is it a win, is it a loss, is it a draw? If not, then uh, you want to be coming up with the right plan. So only one minute, and then we'll see the position. Okay, Darren and Burton say draw, okay? So uh, I'm not sure who say draw, but why do you guys think it's a draw? Um, I believe it's a draw because the, the the in order to queen the white king will have to go to the B side, but if he goes to the B side, then the black king can get closer to the pawns. Okay, thank you, Darren. Uh, Tapiwa Gora comes uh, saying it's a it's a win. Why do you say it's a win, Tapiwa? Well, since it, it is white, white turn to play, um, he can prevent the Black King from crossing over to C8. Um, and there's enough time uh, for the King, uh, from the White King going to B7 and helping along the pawns to Queen. And Black will eventually lose the Bishop for one of the pawns. Okay. A few people are saying true. So let us do this. Tapiwa says he's winning. There's a number of people who have said true. There's at least four people who are saying a draw. So let's just make a, a, a real life example uh, so that we all learn. This is the best part of learning is to put into practice what we are saying. So I'm going to pair Tapiwa with one of the players here saying it's a draw. We'll use their alphabet. Okay, so it seems Darren. Darren, you play with black and Tapua will play with white. Let's see what the result is going to be. You can just call out the moves. So in this position, it's white to play. Tapua? Um, I'll play bishop g5. Okay, Tapua plays bishop g5. Darren, what is your move? Bishop f5. Bishop f5. Okay, Tapua? Uh, King c7. King C7. Um, King F7. King F7. Uh, then King D8. King D8. Uh, King E6. King E6. Hmm. <laughs> okay, maybe King D8 was too hasty. Uh, and do not still rush. a win. Yes. That's why it's in all camps. Yeah, but of course it's still a win. Yeah, the question is win. So, but do not rush. Yeah, okay. What is the move? Hmm. Yeah, maybe I can just play C7. Yeah, the position is still winning. So C7, yeah. Darren's idea was cute. No, King D5, but the problem, Darren, is then this is the annoying thing. Bishop E3, you see? And now yeah. you, you are not able to win this C, uh, this C5 pawn. And yeah, even here, your opponent can be annoying. They can even sacrifice the bishop and not take. They'll make a queen. And when you take again, 
the king cannot fly to c8, uh, it will be a loss. Okay, so uh, Darren, it, it didn't go according to plan. So let's just get someone else to help you with your statement. That is a draw, and then we'll move on to the next example. So I think next in the alphabet, it's Matthew. Matthew, yeah. try to make a draw with Tapio. Again, the one who said it's winning. So Tapio's move is bishop g5 from the last game. Uh, Matthew, how would you continue the defense that black is win is drawing? Yes. 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 Matthew, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm here. Okay. So it is your turn to play. What? Okay. Um, Bishop C8. Bishop C8. Okay, King C7. King C7. Um, Bishop G4. Bishop G4. King B8. King B8. Who's turn is it to play? Matthew. Yeah. Um, Bishop F5. It's a loss. Okay. Yeah, then C7. All right, C7, C8, and then it's the same thing, right? So the position is not... Uh... Okay, yeah. Can I hey, not say? Try? Yeah. Who wants to give it a try? I'd like to give it one try if that's okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so you want to give it a try to hold the draw? Yeah, to yes, hold it. Sir. So there, there's Clayton and David now, both who want to make a draw. So let's... Okay, so if we are going to stick with the alphabet, let's give it to Clayton first and then David. And then we'll, we'll, look, at, we'll look at the next few positions before the games. Okay, let's start with Clayton. Tapio's move is bishop g5. Bishop h3. Bishop h3. Okay. Okay, uh, king c7. King c7. Bishop g2. Bishop g2. Um, Clayton, you can't move to somewhere where it's a bit quieter. Okay. Uh, King B6. King B6. Um, Bishop F3 Bishop F3 Okay, Tapio, uh, what are the winning ideas? 
Okay, uh, maybe play. I should play by King C7. King C7. Bishop G2. Uh, Bishop then G2. King to D6. King to D6. Bishop big H3. Bishop uh, C7. C7. Uh, Bishop F5. Bishop F5. Um, C6. <laughs> no, not everyone can try, please. Uh, we've already we have taken more time than I was thinking we should. Uh, but what did you say, Bishop? No, C6. King C6. King C6. No, the yeah, pawn. Oh, pawn C6, okay. Yeah. Uh, Bishop C8. Yeah, this is a draw, isn't it? Mm. No, 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 you want this. Yeah, I want to run around with the king. Yeah, yeah, I see. King there and then B8. I think it would have been quicker though to play king c6 rather than playing playing pawn c6. You would have got there quicker. Oh yeah, maybe. Yeah, because now here, no, but the problem is you don't have king b6 if you don't start with c6, because now this king can come in. Yeah, so maybe. But don't you just push the pawn to check and move the king out the way? Ah, okay. I think it's all right. I see what you mean. Yeah, maybe Bishop C8 wasn't precise. But this one, okay. I still think this allows your king, the opponent's king, to be active. Usually, yeah. in the open uh, in the end game, don't allow the opponent's king to be active. This C6 is correct. After yeah. this, how is this king going to defend? It has to go the way around. And now this yeah, it one is goes around. Yeah, yeah. To F7, E6, and then to D6. Ah, okay. But now this loses. Then we take the bishop. Because after king here, king d6, okay, the bishop maybe goes here, right? Yeah, then king b7. King b7. It's gg. You can't defend both threats. C ah, even still, the king stays here. They can play here. And now, ah, okay, you have this one. You have check. Now the king is needs to find a square, but still here, queen, we take the pawn. So I think no, you missed it up. It's a draw, yeah. You... Okay, very good defense from Clayton. I think, David, was your idea the same? Very much the same. Yeah, so the main idea is to put the bishop on f3. So bishop g5 immediate is met by c7. Mm -hmm. I'll just now punch in the moves because of time, but very good. Thank you, everyone, for the effort. Uh, the position is going to be a draw. It's not going to be a, a win. Now, the people who made who said it was draw, sure, it was correct to, agree, to say it's a draw, but what I wanted to show us with that little example was it's very easy to see the right idea or the right judgment, but playing it is another thing. Now, of course, I know I'm putting you on the spot. You have to play in front of all of the all, all, all the people here. But this is how you become a better chess player. When you take uh, challenges, when you have to do things under pressure, it's mm -hmm. going to, to give you more motivation to continue working. And yeah, it's not to, to, uh, to show off or to put anyone down. It's, so, it's a challenge. Uh, more than anything, I hope you know this uh, time we have tonight, is you leave here with a challenge to really go and study this uh, end games even more. Because like I said, we can only cover some of the things, not all the things in one night. Uh, so yeah, okay. Uh, Bishop g5, c7 can be played. No, Bishop g7, Bishop f5 is the idea. And c7, 
bishop h3 very good idea by clayton and also uh, david so keep the bishop on this diagonal until white is forced to push the pawns and then after this uh bishop c8 which is a very important move king c5 and now like we saw king f7 we bypass and come around this way because the king and now you notice why it is important to have your king active bring your king to the center when we could not bring the king into the center with uh, i think it was matthew and uh, and darren white was able to win but when the king okay darren almost found a nice idea but unfortunately this bishop e3 was annoying so the king sort of came to the center but it was a little bit too late because this king was too active now but in this way the bishop was buying time staying on the long diagonal until the white is pushed upon. And now the king was a bit too slow. And this position, as we saw, uh, it will end as a draw. And immediately, C C7 in the starting position also leads to uh, nothing. Uh, because after C7, just bishop F3. No, can't be bishop F3. The guy is queening. Uh, okay. So one c7, the same idea, just keep your bishop here. And white can't make progress. If you move your king here, we can just go here. If the king goes here, we have enough uh, pieces to defend. All right. So this is what this is with isolated pawns. This is the idea with isolated pawns. Uh, let's look at a position with connected pawns. So these ones will move a little bit faster. Uh, I'll just ask for the right uh, judgment, but I'll play out the most myself so that we can try to cover a little, also some of the same color bishop ending ideas. Uh, okay, so here, this is the position and it is white stand. Okay. What do you think is the right judgment here in this position? Is it a win? Is it a draw? It is white to play. I didn't say always 10. It is white to play. Is it a win? Is it a draw? Is it a loss? Anyone wants to give a go? Is it a win, loss, or draw? White to play. Everyone can still hear me? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. I think this is a win. It's... Yeah, this is a win. You must just win, play with your yeah. pawns on what's it, opposite color of the bishop. That is correct. So the, this is the right judgment is this one is winning. And we'll just show the moves. Bishop h4 check in f7. And then king d4. The idea is not to rush by pushing these pawns. Right? It is important to uh, take away the f6 square from this black king. Um, because if you push the pawns too early, the king can sit on an active position. And now after king to d4, uh, the king is headed to d6. That's the idea. You want to make sure your pieces are active first. And you see why earlier on this sort of uh, strategy always help you, even if you are not too sure about the concrete position, this can at least help you to find a plan. Bring your king into the center and all of that. Your Always make sure your pieces are active and do not rush. And as we could see earlier, even with that position where it is a draw, but if we rush, it cannot, we can lose the game. Uh, and here after king to d4, king g7, the blacking is useless. Oh, this is a very uh, important tip. Always try to make sure your opponent's king is doing nothing useful in end games. Uh, king g7, and then finally e6. Uh, followed by king to e5, king to g6, and now the pawns 
are going to queen because this sacrifice doesn't work. Remember, we said you must only watch out if you have the rook pawn for the sacrifice, right? We call this sacrifice the desperado, like he's trying to desperately save the position, but here it doesn't work. This position is terribly lost because uh, white is able to get king e5, king to d6, and the king can't attack the pawn. You see why it was important to keep hold of the f6 square before we pushed, because now the king has to come this way, and now uh, this is now obvious. Uh, the position is simply losing. Even the bishop takes away d8. Blank cannot take opposition after this move check. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't, don't rush. You see, now I'm rushing. King d7, you see? <laughs> this could have been a sad situation, right? Uh, but even with this, you can still move back. Uh, because we have an extra piece, you make a, you make a queen now. But yeah, just the precise way is to go right away king here. That's why the king comes into, into the center to support its pass pawn. Now the pawn will queen. Okay, let's go to some of the strategic ideas in endings with bishop of opposite color. So this is some of the topics here. Create a fortress. What do you think uh, a fortress means? Um, isn't it like uh, where you create a position that uh, the enemy can't break down? That is very true. Thank you, uh, Rowan. Right. And this is one thing you need to understand. The creating of a fortress is the most important plan when you play with bishop of opposite color. You are creating a position, as Rowan said, that the opponent is not able to break down your defenses. Let us see an example to help us have a picture of this information. So we have a, an example of this. Uh, okay, it is white stem. Now, white is up with two pawns, two pass pawns, uh, if I might add. White would usually be winning if this was any other endgame. But we have the opposite color bishop ending. Like I said, they are not always draw, but there is a very high chance of making draws if you play correctly, right? But some of them, you can just lose them, as we saw just before now, right? So not all of them are draws, but they have a high chance of finding draws. And one of the high chances to make a draw in opposite color endings is to find the idea of a fortress. Uh, you want to create a, a defense that your opponent can break down. It is, this position was set up in 1957 by uh, Chirion. It is white to, uh, it's, um, it's white to play and white can't make progress. The defenses of black are rock solid. The bishop has a long diagonal. Always make sure your bishop stays on the long diagonal if you are defending in bishop endings, whether it's the opposite color or the same color. If you put your bishop on the short diagonal like a7, you are, you are looking for trouble. Always make sure, as we saw with Clayton and also the same idea David had, keep the bishop on the long diagonal where it is active and you are going to cause problems for the opponent to find a way through. Here, the opponent has created a defense that cannot be broken. White can't play f4 because if white plays f4, bishop captures. C7 cannot be played, bishop captures. And there is no way for white to break this defense down. And notice what is important. All of black species are active. Please, if you learn anything else today, make sure you understand this. All your pieces must be active in endgame. Always. You save a lot of draws and even win many games by just having more active pieces. It's extremely important. That. And here, because of this, we can just see some of the possible continuations. King f5, king d4, going after the c6 pawn. Uh, king e6, uh, king e6, and then king to c5, threatening to take the pawn. Uh, king d7, defending the pawn. King b6. Now, notice, white was threatening to support the pass pawn to queen, or at least to win the bishop here. 
we followed the king. You see, here our king was helping the bishop stop F4 from being pushed. And now when we see white headed towards this side, our king is following. So that by the time white threatens C7, our king and bishop are both guarding this important C7 square. Uh, and because of this, white is not able to make any progress. Uh, bishop to E8, bishop C7, king C8, bishop D6, king D7, bishop C7, and so on and so forth. Are we all convinced that this position is a draw? May I oh, ask is... a question? Yes, please. Uh, could you just go to the start quickly? Okay, so yeah, king. So it was first king f5? Um, yes, king f5. King d4? Yes. King e6? King e6, king c5. Bishop e8. Uh, okay, bishop e8 now. Yeah. Okay. So what is your idea? So is it possible to still try and get king back to f f5 and then push f4 no the king will catch it right yeah if you yeah. go f5 king d4 then it's the same thing yeah yeah and if so f4 then king e3 and then you're going to lose the pawn no matter what yeah because now for now i'll, I'll make a waiting move and i'm waiting to see where you want to go so if you come back i'll follow you again uh, okay. okay of course Thank you. because now i can even win this pawn after king e3 and then this will be much closer to a draw because this pawn was sacrificed. But yeah, thanks for that uh, question. But it's a good thing. By the way, let's all learn from uh, that curious mind that David is showing. In the end game, never agree to draws prematurely. You know some players, and I speak to, I'm telling myself, I was playing in a tournament just a few weeks ago. I took a lot of draws probably because I'd lost in a number of games the last tournament, but uh, <laughs> I, I had to, uh, I, I, I realized many of the end games, I could have won them, but I just didn't play on. So let's all learn from uh, coach David Baxter. Always try to ask a lot of questions in end games. This is, uh, we'll try to see one or at least one or two games to teach us some of these habits. Grandmasters will play until the next day if they will. They are going to continue asking questions. Now, earlier on, uh, we both we all agreed that this position was a draw, right? I'm sure when when I set it up, uh, all of us we jumped, uh, myself included, that it's a draw. But it turns out the position is not a draw, right? We had missed a very important detail. So let us go back and look at that. It's black to play uh, in this position. Court of Bodvinik, Moscow. 1955. So in this position, black to play, try to find the winning plan for black. So earlier on, I apologize, we made a mistake. The evaluation we came up with was wrong. Now, if we have the wrong evaluation, the plan will always be wrong. This position is not a draw. The position is actually winning for black. So find a winning plan for black. How would you win this position with black. Anyone wants to guess any move? Just guess the move. Because of time, we need to move a bit faster. King e4. King e4 is a nice move. At least it centralizes the king. Okay. But there's a better move. It's a good move, but there's a better move. It's a very, it's out of, out of the box. It just goes to the yeah, point of this position. Uh, it's g5 here. You have seen this position, right? Yeah. Okay. Very yeah. well. <laughs> g5. This is from Bodvinik Kotov uh, in Moscow, 1955. Uh, then this also helps me support the point about what I was saying about uh, the desire from Coach David to play on even if it looks a draw. 
always try to find a way to win in end games, even if it looks drawn. And this move, not many of us can see. It's a very uh, unique move to see. Uh, but the theme we are looking for now is creating two passed pawns. This is a very important idea in two. When you play opposite color bishop endings, try to create two passed pawns. Now, listen, if the typical plan is to create a passed pawn, imagine if you have two of them. That, that will surely cause the opponent many problems. Because we know in chess, you can defend one weakness or right, but you can't defend two weaknesses at the same time. You are not able to be outstretched like that. And that's basically the idea here. G5 is a powerful move. Double exclamation mark. And here, Keres was, lost the game soon. G5, by sacrificing uh, two pawns, black creates two pass pawns. A pass pawn on b3 and a pass pawn on the h file uh, so now after g5 fg trying to refuse no uh, to to allow the opponent to have those two pass pawns right because now they are going to sacrifice this pawn again uh, or in fact start pushing this one and then sacrifice later uh, so here in the game keres played fg and then d4 D4 check, you know, it's like, it's, it's crazy. You know, the guy is just giving away pawns. Normally we teach, uh, we teach players not to give up material, but this just shows how much uh, the grandmasters want to win, uh, especially end games. They will make their opponent suffer uh, because in the end game, there's not that many pieces. So you can really think very deeply. You can, come, you can become very creative in chess endings. The, this is why some of these things, uh, we can see them. Now, ED, and now King G3, we create that second pass pawn. And this is going to be too much for, for white to deal with. Uh, after King G3, Bishop to A3, trying to stop this pawn from going anywhere. And after this, uh, King H4, King to G3, King G5, King E4, trying to play D5 or something. Uh, and then now, pass pawns must be pushed. Right. If you have a pass pawn, you need to push it, especially when the opponent can't stop you from doing it. Because the closer the pawn gets to the queening square, uh, the more problems the opponent has to deal with. After h4, king f3, uh, and bishop d5 check. So the idea, the white resigned very early, but the main reason why uh, white resigned is that this king has to babysit this pawn, right? And this king is going to come in uh, into C2 uh, at some moment, and we are going to be able to, uh, to win the bishop. And also, we can keep this pawn from being captured. When the bishop stands next to the pawn like this, they create a fortress. The opponent's king is not able to uh, to come near. But of course, the eager student is in, encouraged to investigate this thing further. Because of time, we won't be able to see all the details. Let's go to the next one. Uh, but at least you know the main idea. This is the most important thing. So let's go to the last point on opposite color bishops. Okay, this is the position. It is black to play. So the next idea is you want to attack the opponent's pawns with the bishop, right? In opposite color endings, if the opponent's pawns are on the same color, that means we can attack them. So we want to tie down our opponent by attacking their pawns. And we are going to see a theme here. This position is a draw. Uh, it's black to play so we'll see why it is a draw so black to play bishop g6 bishop g6 right away starts an attack against the e4 pawn the pawn uh the opponent can't move their king away because we'll capture so bishop e, so black ties down the white king to defending the pawn so the king now must come to e5 and now bishop h7 
making sure we are tying down the king to this pawn. The king can't move away. It can't become more active because we are attacking the, the pawn on e4. The king goes to f4 again, bishop to g6. And e5, bishop to f7, attacking the pawn on uh, e5. And after king here, bishop to g8, uh, the position is a draw. Now, who believes that this position will end as a draw? Oh, no, if you don't believe, why do you say it won't be a draw? Mm. Yeah, because you don't have to take my word for it, but yeah, okay. Like I said, uh, the ICA student is encouraged to investigate these things, but I'll show you why it's a draw. The reason why it's a draw is that if you push these pawns, this is an easy draw, right? The bishop, as we have seen earlier on, some of these things will become a bit quicker now because we have been doing this for a long time in this lesson. When your bishop can stay on the long diagonal and it is active, the defense is very easy. And also, the king can't be chased away by this bishop. So this one is very easy. And now, if white uh, plays here, how would you make a draw? Very simple. Just sacrifice. As we learned at the very beginning, you cannot checkmate with the bishop versus king. So this always is a theme in the air. And now, because we are tying down this king to this pawn, how can white improve their position? What can they do? They can't leave this pawn undefended. If they push it, it's an easy draw. If they push this one, it's an easy draw. Uh, uh, I see. E6. E6. Someone said E6. That's a dead draw. E6, we sacrifice, right? Yeah. That would be a draw on the spot. The bishop cannot checkmate. We need at least another bishop or another knight. That's why the bishop and knight are called minor pieces, because on their own with the king, they cannot perform checkmate. And that's why the rook and the queen are called major pieces, because a rook and a king can checkmate a king, a queen and a king can checkmate a king, but a bishop and a knight on their own, it is not possible. Uh, impossible, as the Spanish would say, impossible. It cannot happen. This is a draw. All right, let's just uh, look at a few things about the same color endings. Uh, so every chess player must know these following positions by heart. Uh, again, there is a lot of material here, but as you have seen, of course, there's a lot of positions, but when you know the basic ideas, it suddenly becomes not so difficult. It will take hard work. I'm not going to sell it short. It will take hard work, but it can be done. I mean, friends, listen, if you put in some effort, you can become a good chess player. You don't need to be a super smart person to become good at chess. Just hard work and taking advantage of opportunities like this. Come to these lessons, go and learn in your own time, play a lot of chess game, analyze them, but especially, please, if you can find a very good book uh, on endings, even the small books that you find in the libraries, that have a portion on endings, just start somewhere. You don't have to start by reading the Dvoretsky manual. That's not really advised. Start somewhere, but make a, a decision to work well on your endings, particularly our subject at hand here, the bishop uh, and king pawn endings. Okay, let's see some important positions. Um, so bishop and pawn against bishop. We are going to look at this one. This one is a very instructive position, very yeah, important. It, yeah, it's bishop to, to e2, isn't it, to try and get the bishop off the diagonal? Uh, bishop e2, yeah, well, you, this idea okay. would win, right, if the opponent takes. And then we'll easily make a queen. But normally, which is what the end games teaches us, that the opponent is more resourceful than we want to, to allow them. So. Uh, the, 
if it is uh, 198, just need to make sure I show the right uh, variations, not like what I did last time. The plan is to transfer your bishop to c6, to cut off the bishop. Right. We want to get our bishop to c6 so that we can push the d7 uh, pawn, and then we'll make it queen. Uh, because if you go here, this is, uh, oh, this is not losing. This will be a draw. Right, because this is this is a this is a drawn king and pawn ending. No, it's not. It's losing. Yeah, sorry. It's just yeah. We draw. We force the king out of the square, right? Because now the king can't stay anywhere here. And then you make a queen. So that's the that's the plan in this position. This bishop is on a long diagonal. It's not the longest. It's five squares. So we can we need to make this. Uh, diagonal short so that the bishop won't be able to control this key square as our pawn is already threatening to reach d8 we just need to get rid of this bishop by going bishop c6 followed by bishop to c6 and then we are going to promote to a queen is there any questions about this position or this position i mean Okay, there seems to be no question. Let's look at the next diagram. Um, yes. Go ahead. It's white to play, right? It is white to play, yes. Um, you could play bishop to f3 with a plan mm -hmm. of moving to c6. Yes. Blocking the bishops. Diagonal, mm -hmm. or maybe you could play bishop to g4, pushing to bishop d7. Yeah, but bishop d7 doesn't work. I think it's Haggai, is it? If I remember correctly, yes, okay, Haggai, right? So this one doesn't work because the, the bishop can change itself, it can come to this other diagonal. So you don't want to allow them this time because of course we can't move like that. Say we just make this position. Uh, the opponent can change the diagonal. This is what they'll do. When you move this bishop somewhere, I am going to take that next diagonal. If you move here, you see what happens. I come to this one and now you have just helped me. So the correct way to get rid of my bishop is to move through here. Because this doesn't give me time to come to e2, you see? Well, you could say, well, can't I come to h, f1? Oops. Right? Yes. And then it's lost. So that's why bishop f3 is the key idea. Bishop f3, bishop c6, white, uh, black, and resign. Uh, okay, so let's just look okay. one more. Position. Yeah. Let's look at uh, one position again. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, and then we'll just look at and towards the end of a game that was played where Magnus Carlsen of all people lost in a bishop endgame, bishop and king pawn ending. Uh, he lost a very, after a very long game. So we'll finish with that, but I'll just quickly show you this other example of the position you need to know. So this was uh, set up in 1856 by Centurini. And this position is winning for white. Uh, the reason the position is winning is because we are going now. The bishop is very active. We could say, well, wasn't this man saying if the bishop is on the long diagonal, there are chances? Well, they would have been if the king was a bit closer. The king is too far away. So the plan is similar like the other one. Bishop c6 gets in the way of this bishop so we can push the pawn. Bishop c6, bishop e2. Bishop d5, bishop to b5. Of course, if you are defending, try to stop the pawn from moving forward. Bishop e6. Uh, bishop e6, king e3. Bishop d7, chase this bishop away. And bishop to a6. Finally, progress. We can push our pawn. 
king to d4, c7. Now the pawn is almost winning. Uh, king c4, bishop to h3, threatening bishop f1 check with his q1, winning the bishop. And now king b4, after king b4, king to c6. Now you see when the diagonal is short, your bishop is in trouble because it is not too active. That means this position is now losing. I think the principle is that if the diagonal is less than five squares long, the position is losing. So this is only two squares long. So here we know that the bishop is not going to be able to defend any longer. After king b, well, king b6, white is winning. All right. The threat is to play king to b6. So if the opponent would stop that, how would you win here if you are playing with white? What would you play? Anyone wants to tell us? Bishop f1. Yeah, bishop f1 is an idea, but of course, bishop f1, the opponent can also go here now, you see? So the, now this is what I hope anyway, some of these things will make sense. That's why these principles are important to help us in end games. We can't win by one move tactics mainly in end games, right? We need to think, who else think what else can you do here to win if you're playing with white? Um, probably king d7 followed by bishop f1. No, you just put the opponent in zooks one. These are the kind of tactics that you learn in end games alone. This <laughs> king, oh this God. king, this king must be here, but they can't. Now, your opponent wants this is the best piece, piece placement they want, but they can't stay there. Now, one of them must move. The bishop has to move away from this diagonal. Or the king must move away, which allows us to play king d6, and the opponent can start to cry. It's losing, right? The bishop can't stay here any longer. We'll make a queen. All right. Uh, okay, let's just quickly um, look at just a few moves. And the other one, I thought I think I saw a, a move. Okay, what is the move? Uh behind again. Okay. So, Haggai, what is the move that you saw? Um, behind again, like kind of there to the beginning. Oh, okay. <laughs> we are out of time, though, Haggai. I don't want to not be invited again because I went over time. You can some of these questions you can satisfy yourself. Set up the positions and practice them yourself. We can't learn everything tonight. Okay. Uh, so even the game, the games I'll share with Michael with all the other material. I'll try to, the positions we covered, I'll try to just have them on leeches and you can practice with many, many exercises on what we learned today. Uh, so before I hand over to Michael, is there any questions that anyone has about the lesson and what was covered today? You know, at the end of your page, it said practice and skills. Yes, the practice and skill is the diagrams I'll share with Michael, the exercises of what we have uh, done today. Okay. Thank you. okay, cool. And also I'll share some videos who can uh, help with even more information than I could give uh, as part of the extra practice and skill. And it, that practice and skill is the most important part of the lesson. To actually put into practice what we have learned, uh, it's important. Uh, okay, does anyone else have something to say? Um, our bishop end games, do you always have to go deep, like into positional play? Uh, yeah, well, you must. You must know how to plan and come up with the right ideas. There you can't just follow with one move tactics. It won't work. Uh, but okay, we are out of time. Thank you, everyone. It was fun. Uh, of course, I Thank wish you would stay here. The whole night, but we can't. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Dion. I will share that material on the WhatsApp group. And yeah, thank you everyone for coming. And I hope to see you all next week. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.
Good night. Michael, can I ask you a quick question before yep. you go? Sure thing, David. If we could just have a quick minute to speak. Uh, mm, is yeah. it? All right. So for the week afterwards, you know, like uh, you said, you showed me your presentation. So I need to show Andrew one of those or what I'm going to do. Yeah. And then when we do the Zoom over here, you and me, mm -hmm. um, so you're going to start it and then you hand control over to me. Is that how it works? Yeah, basically the screen sharing is just given to you. I'll be the host of the meeting still. Okay. Now, I, I saw you were host of the meeting. I was wanting to ask that question. I needed to know. Yeah. How the... I'm addicted to the power it gives me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but okay. I'm going to end the meeting there. If no one else. Thank you very questions? much, Michael. I got that. No worries. Thank you all for coming. Have a good evening. You too. Bye.